First Thessalonians chapter 3, we'll begin in the first verse. And as is our custom, I'm going to ask you to stand again for the reading of God's Word. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it came to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us to the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly, and long to see us as we long to see you, For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Father, may you make your word come alive to us and For some, it may be unto salvation. And for us who know you, your son, may your spirit uh, search us. Uh, May we examine ourselves. May you uh, give us instruction that becomes practice in our lives. And that you would be honored and pleased to draw all attention to the Lord Jesus. And we thank you in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we continue our journey through 1 Thessalonians. You know, First Thessalonians, we're witnessing a model church, as we've said numerous times. Uh, this is in line with our vision for the year, being the church that makes a difference in the world. And as we look at the Apostle Paul and his relationship with these Thessalonians, we are witnessing a biblical community alive. Uh, they were marked by a triad of virtues which define all of the Christian life. If you go back in verse 3 of chapter 1, you will see those very virtues. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning in our prayers, remembering for our God and Father your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the simplicity of Christianity. Uh, Those three statements, work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in Christ, these are the interpretive lens by which to see this letter and to see this church. And it even extends, that is, it is the interpretive lens to look all of the Christian life as a way of evaluating ourselves by the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope. Now, as we work our way through this letter, what we're going to see, and we have seen, is these virtues are are fleshed out. They're fleshed out. The work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope is fleshed out first in the Apostle Paul's sacrificial service and love for the Thessalonians. This is one of the most personal letters that he would write, and he is not guarded as he shares his love for these people. And he's not guarded in telling them the level of sacrificial service that he gave to these people. And in a reciprocating way, we see the Thessalonians in their commitment to the word and love for Paul and love for one another. So what we, what we witness throughout this letter is this wonderful harmony between leadership and a congregation, between uh, God's people in their oneness working out the Christian life as it is the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfast hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, today we're in verse 6 and 6 through 10. You know, we looked at the, uh, the opening of verses. We read that just for the connecting factor of it. But what we see in verses um, 1 through 5 is we see Paul's anxiety. We see Paul is very anxious over the state of these Thessalonians. Back in chapter 2, we saw that he tried repeatedly to go to them. He wanted to know how they were doing spiritually. They were dear to him. And he wanted to know if his labor was in vain or not. And he said, Satan has hindered us from coming. And so he didn't know. These were young Christians. They were suffering persecution, the very type of persecution and suffering that he had encountered when he was there as the church planner. 
And so now his heart is aching, even to the point of anxiety. He is anxious, and he would mention that in verse 3, verse 1 and 5. I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 1 and 5, when he would say, we could bear it no longer. We are so anxious to know how you're doing because we love you so much that I can hardly stand it. I need to know how you're doing. Now, before we move on uh, into the encouraging report of the Thessalonians, I want to just take a a short detour and talk about anxiety. And if I was to ask every one of you, and uh, and I will, uh, how many of you have been anxious over anything in the last seven days? Every one of you, raise your hand, please. Because that's the reality of living life in the fallen world. It's the reality of us uh, having remaining sin. Anxiety and being anxious is a very real part uh, of the world we live in. During this past year, would you not say that the world has been gripped in fear? It's been gripped in anxiety, um, multiplied countless times. But I want us to think about anxiety. And again, this is a side note, but it's an important note. I want you to look at the anxiety and the issue of anxiety in two ways. In two ways. And the first one is that there is a good type of anxiety. There really is. The type that Paul is having for the Thessalonians is a good type of anxiety. You can see his heart and you can see his mind when he says, and he couldn't say it any more emphatically, I just can't stand it any longer. I am in such angst over you that I need to find out how you're doing. That is a good type of anxiety. It's an anxiety that extends in verbal terms and heart language how much I care for you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, we had the actual word anxiety used by the Apostle Paul. He had just cataloged all the suffering that he had endured for the gospel. Shipwreck, sleepless, hungry, on and on. And then he would add this, and oh, apart from all those, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. That's not a sinful anxiety. That is a good anxiety. The word in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight translates concern or care. It shows that Paul's anxiety was away from himself and on to the care of others. And no doubt it would have led to his consistent and fervent prayer for the Thessalonians and all the churches under his care. So understand that anxiety, it's not just to be looked at as sinful. There is a good form of anxiety. It's one that's focused away from yourself and on that of others and their welfare. But then there is the sinful anxiety, which many of us, if not all of us in some degrees, have experienced. It could be, it could be defined as fretting or worrying over the things in the world, worrying what's happening to us, or, or the living in the realm of the what-ifs. This is the type of anxiety that is sinful. It's the type of anxiety that Jesus commands against. In Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, verse 25, verse 31, and verse 34, Jesus emphatically says, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious about your life. Do not be anxious about what you shall eat. Do not be anxious about what you shall drink. He said, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Our Lord commands us three times not to be anxious. So there is an anxiety that if we allow is sinful. And the difference is this. Jesus points us to the command not to be anxious over ourselves and over the cares of the world. It's largely around our security. The anxiety that Paul has is good because it's focused away from himself and on to others. Sinful anxiety is all about me. It's all about my. It's all about mine. And it deals with unbelief and mistrust of worry over God's promised provision to us. Well, now, Paul is not anxious over the Thessalonians. Look at verse 6. He already said twice, I can't stand it. I'm anxious. I need to know how you're doing. And what does he do? He says, but now. He's relieved. His anxiety is quieted. Why? Because the report from Timothy on these Thessalonians is a good report. It is a good report. 
He says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. You can see the Apostle Paul, the burden lifting off of him as he knows that they're doing well. That in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution, and even in their infancy as Christians, they are doing well. And he commends them. He commends them for their, their work of faith and their work of love. Again, verse 6 in the very beginning. What does he highlight the report? How does Timothy highlight the report? He highlights the report by their faith and their love. Basically, what we're reading in this section here is an affirmation and a continuance of the reputation that they already established in chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1 and look at verse 6. This is how they started. And this is also how they continued. And Paul is rejoicing because the faith and love that they initially uh, professed and practiced is deepening. Look what happens in verse 6 of chapter 1. What a wonderful testimony that they started well and they were continuing well. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Archaea. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Archaea. But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. What a glowing affirmation from the apostle Paul of these young believers. They had become imitators. They received the word in much sorrow or much suffering. They knew the joy of the Holy Spirit. They became examples to other believers. The word of God was sounding forth from them. Their faith was going everywhere. They turned from, to God from idols and they were patiently waiting for the Lord Jesus. What a wonderful glowing testimony uh, for any Christian to have. And in particular, in our case, we're looking at this as a model church. What a wonderful te uh, testimony for us to have. For God to be able to write to us, quinescent, as a church that modeled these very fruits of transformation, of conversion. And so Paul, as he affirms them in chapter 1, he knows time is going on. And he knows that pressure and, and suffering and affliction can wear you down. And so the anxiety starts to settle in. He hasn't heard. He doesn't know. They started out well. His, his work was fruitful. But now he's wondering... I wonder how they're doing. I wonder if they're, if, they're, if they're finishing, or I should say continuing in how they started. And so Timothy sends the report back. And that report is in verse 6 through 10 of chapter 3. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. And we're going to look at it uh, under the title of their reputation. Their reputation. You know, reputation matters. Reputation matters a lot. And you see what a contrasting um, picture of reputations between this church and the Corinthian church. Paul would say of the Corinthian church, which was a, a mess. He would say, it is, I have heard it from Chloe's people that there is division among you. What a shameful thing for the church of Jesus Christ, any local assembly, to have a reputation down the road. Don't go there. There's a ton of stuff going on there. You just stay away from that place. That would have been the reputation of the Corinthian church. But conversely, look at the Thessalonian church. They were known for their work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfast hope. And that's the type of church where, where you, you would hear, hey, you got to go there. You got to go there. That's a loving community. That's a community of standing tall for the faith. Uh, they are laboring with each other in love. And everywhere you go, you hear of the Thessalonians sharing the gospel. Everywhere they went, the word of God was sounding from them. And so as we look at their reputation today, let it serve as an examination in us, as a church, 
in us as individually. Because your reputation as a Christian, you have one. And you are building one. I have one. I am building on it. And your reputation is either going to be a glowing one, or it is going to be a confusing one. You don't have an option when it comes to being a witness for Christ. And if you're a Christian, you have no option of being a witness. You have no option of your reputation. But you do have the option of what kind it's going to be. Whether or not it's going to mark the Thessalonians. Or whether it's going to be one of confusion. One of, huh? He, she, Christian? I don't see it. Let's take a look at the reputation of these Thessalonians. And if you have an outline, you can follow along. And if you don't, they're back there on the table. I encourage you to take one. Well, the first thing we want to see in verse 6 is a reputation to pursue. A reputation to pursue. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. Now, note what Paul's emphasis is. He is not affirming them through Timothy's report of what they're doing in the culture. He's he's affirming them, and the reputation they have is this work of faith and labor of love of how they started out. And that's so critical because you don't measure your spirituality by your activity. And you don't measure the effectiveness of your church by the amount of ministry that you do. You measure it by the character of the people, the character of the workers, the character of the laborers. You can be knee deep in sin and be out every day sharing the gospel. But the reality of of our reputation, it's based on relationship. Paul commends them for their faith and love. That is fleshed out in the vertical and the horizontal. Faith is towards God, and love is towards God and people horizontally. And Paul was all about the relationship. He was all about building a reputation of one of faith and of love, which he commends these Thessalonians. We can stop right now and ask ourselves the question, get alone with God and our Bible, and ask, Lord, is my reputation in my home, in my church, on my job, is my reputation one of a man or a woman that is growing in the faith vertically and growing in love vertically and and horizontally? Paul was identifying in their reputation and one to pursue that they were marked by the simpleness of Christianity, and that is faith and love. Friends, there'll be nothing more important or nothing would ever be said about us that is of greater value than to be known and marked as a man or a woman of faith and love. And I'll talk more about this briefly, but they can't be separated. You cannot claim to have faith in the living God and be loveless. It's just incompatible and it's a biblical contradiction. Now, this was something that Paul would not only affirm in the Thessalonians, but it's also what he would say to Timothy in his first letter to encourage this young pastor is he tells him that that's the sum of it all. The sum of it all is a life of faith and a life of love. He would tell Timothy in chapter 1, verse 5, the aim or the goal of our instruction, the end of all the commandment is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. What a beautiful, simple vision statement for every Christian and church that we would have a love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So Paul and Timothy, with all the struggles of pastoral ministry, with all the distractions, with all the the temptations and discouragement, he would start out by telling this young, struggling pastor that the end of your call, the end of your goal is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And that's exactly why he affirms the Thessalonians. He says, Timothy, come back, and my anxiety has grown wings and flown away. Because I know that you are growing in the chief virtues of the Christian life. You are growing in faith and growing in love. And it wasn't just Timothy. The Apostle Paul would tell the Galatians who were struggling in themselves with the doctrine of justification by faith. 
He would tell the Galatians in 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Let me encourage you to do a study. Trace those uh, triad of virtues, faith, love, and hope, through the New Testament, and you're going to find that triad appears numerous times together. It not only defines the Christian life, it, not only, it, it defines the compass by which to live the Christian life. Faith, love, and hope. And when it comes right down to it, a reputation that we are to pursue is the one that of the Thessalonians. A reputation of faithfulness and a reputation of love. And this is what Timmy would say, Timothy would say. Now, when you, if you want to boil down the goal of the Christian life, the simple goal of the Christian life, not easy, but the simple goal of the Christian life is this. It is conformity to Christ through a maturing faith of trust and obedience to God and a maturing love towards God and people. That's it. That's the simple goal of the Christian life. The ongoing process of conformity to Christ through a maturing faith of trust and obedience to God and the practice of love to him and to one another. That defines the Christian life. I often think, I know I do, I make the Christian life far more complex than God does. Now, I didn't say make it easy, but I do think we make it more complex than it is. And the Thessalonians were affirmed because they had a reputation that they were pursuing. It was a reputation of faithfulness and of love. Now, how do we know that they were, they were living that life? How do we know that they had a reputation of faithfulness? Two words. Two words is found in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It is the word imitators and examples. The greatest thing you're going to leave your kids and the greatest thing you're going to leave your church is a legacy of faithfulness and of love. And Paul would commend these Thessalonians because they indeed had a reputation of faithfulness. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 6-7, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, so that you became examples. Do you see that? They were followers, and then they were examples to follow. That's how it always works. Is it you follow the Lord Jesus. You follow the supreme example. You follow mature Christians as examples. And thus in that transformation, you become imitators of them. And then people see you as an example and they follow you. That's the process of discipleship. It's that constantly circle. I am being discipled by examples. I imitate them. And thus as I grow, I become examples of other, for others to follow. And that reproduction continues in the church. If it doesn't, the church will die. So they had a reputation of faithfulness. And the way that you develop a, a, a reputation of faithfulness, and one of the things that Paul uh, talks about throughout this letter is the second coming of Christ. Now, they were confused about what happens to those who die in the Lord. But you'll find the New Testament writers, they, they always point people believers to the second coming of Christ. This is it throughout Peter's epistles. You know, and, and read them all. Read Paul's. It's, it's, there's, this, there's this linking of the Christian life in the day-to-day -day, uh, gutting it out, trenching it out. There's this linkage to the second coming of Christ. Why is that so? There is nothing that will promote more your holiness than to think often of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Like even daily. Remember what Paul, uh, John says in 1 John? He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are now. It does not yet appear what we will be. But when we see him, we will be like him. And thus this hope purifies you. Think more of the second commandment. Think even in regards to this. Maybe today, it's 1125. When I let you out here at quarter to one. Think about in five minutes that you could see the Lord Jesus. Think about if you lived every day, as Jonathan Edwards would say in one of his resolutions. Think every day, resolve to live as if it was my last day. Think about the radical change that would make in everything that you do. Your marriages, your parenting, on the job, in the church, priorities, investments. Think about that. There was a story about John Wesley 
A lady once asked John Wesley that suppose he were to know that he would die at midnight tomorrow. How would he spend the intervening time? This is how Wesley replied. Why, madame, just as I intend to spend it now, I would preach this evening at Gloucester, and again at five tomorrow morning, five tomorrow morning, after that I would ride to Tewkesbury, preach in the afternoon, meet the societies in the evening, I would then go to Reverend Martin's house, who expects to entertain me. I would talk and pray with the family as usual. I would retire to my room at 10 o'clock, commend myself to my Heavenly Father, lay down to rest, and wake up in glory. What a way to live. Do you know when you live a life of faith and love, that is an inseparable part of your thinking? Because your faith is connected to the one who's coming. And your love is connected to the one who's coming and to one another. So they had a reputation of faithfulness because they were examples and imitators. And if you recall how chapter 1 closes in the testimony that Paul would say of them, and to wait for his son from heaven. That's a motivating power in the Christian life. One of many is to think often on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's now 1137. Imagine at 1127. Imagine at 1130, you're going to come face to face with the Lord. Do you have any regrets with the way you lived the last seven days? May the Thessalonian model of second coming thinking manifested in a life of love and a life of faith become our reputation to pursue as well. Well, how do we know that they had a reputation of love? We saw that they had a reputation of faithfulness. How do we know that they had a reputation of love? Well, it was manifested in two ways, and Paul would recognize them. First off is they had a reputation of love for God. Now, how do you know that you love God? How do you know deep down inside that you love God? It won't be by what you say. It won't be by what you say. It will be by how you live. Not in a bondage way of legalism but in a freeing way of holy love. And Paul would tell them in the letter that they had a reputation of love first for God measured by their obedience. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that just as you have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that's an important phrase, that you do so more and more. What were these believers doing? They were pleasing God. How do you please God? By obeying God. Jesus made it very clear in John chapter 13 through 17. See how many times he refers to loving him and loving his father by obedience. In John 14, 15, he would say, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. The very simplicity of love for God is measured by our simple faith-driven obedience to His commands. That's not hard for us to see in our lives. Is we can sit down and ask ourselves the question. Or better yet, ask someone that knows you best. Do you see increasing patterns of obedience to God's commands in, in my life? And if they love you enough, they'll be honest with you. They'll either affirm, yes, I do. I see you're not like you were a month ago. You're not like you were last year. I see a progressing godliness in you, a progressing conformity to Christ in you. And so the simplicity of the Christian life, faith, hope, and love, and our simplicity to loving God vertically, Jesus made it so simple, yet not easy, but so simple. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Paul says to the Thessalonians, You give an evidence of not only faithfulness, but your reputation is that of love because you are increasing in your obedience, loving God, pleasing Him by your obedience. But we also know that they had a reputation of love because their love was horizontal. Look at chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no, one, no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. What a profound statement. Lord willing, when we get there, we'll try to unpack that. But when you look at the, at the statement, 
What a profound statement for you yourselves, the emphasis on their individualism as well as their corporate witness, you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. When I read that, I had to ask the question, God, am I learning from you to love? And as a Christian, you need to ask that question. Is God teaching you how to love? Not as defined by human beings, but defined by his word and himself. He says, I don't, need to, I don't need to tell you or write to you because you're being taught by God to love one another. And here's a very strong application. If God is truly teaching us, even today, what we're hearing, if God is truly teaching us, what we're learning becomes practice. It becomes practice. Do you know what happened? I've said this before. and It's important to re- reemphasize this. Do you know what happens when you hear truth that's not lived it hardens your heart. The more you hear truth that's not acted upon, the more that you, you lose the wonder of the truth. And when you lose the wonder of the truth, you start drifting to where you'll come in a worship setting and you'll never be in awe of God. You'll open up your Bible and you won't be thrilled that God has given you his Bible. There's a danger with this is that we must understand that to love God means also that we love people and that he is teaching us how to do that. And it's not easy. But let's face it, uh, we have a tendency at times, we may actually rub each other wrong. We may actually have people in our, in our life that are difficult to love, even Christians. But one of the glowing things throughout this letter here is that Paul affirms their impartial love, that they love all. And that can only happen by a transformed heart. Thus, they give evidence of that. But I want to stress the importance of the inseparable nature of faith and love. Inseparable nature of faith and love. You cannot have saving faith and be unloving. Nor can you have love for God and not love for people. You also cannot separate love for truth from love for people. And one of the, the, the examples of that is the church at Ephesus in the Revelation. You remember how Jesus commends that church. And here's, here's what I want to stress for us. If you separate faith and love, if you separate loving God, loving people... If you separate loving truth and loving people, you have just fractured biblical Christianity. In fact, you don't have biblical Christianity. They are inseparable. Faith and love, love for the truth, and love for people is inseparable. In Revelation 2, 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in the right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. A very strong commendation by the Lord that the Ephesian church was, was doctrinally sound. They held right orthodoxy. They love the truth. And then Jesus says, but I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. The Ephesian church in the Revelation received from the Lord a commendation of faithfulness to the truth, but a condemnation for a lack of love. And we must guard that. If we're going to pursue a reputation like the Thessalonians of faithfulness and of love, You must remember that that is a marriage that will never be divorced. That that's a marriage, faith and love, that must be kept together because you jettison the faith if you don't have love. John Crox wrote a wonderful little book, and um, it's called Graciousness. And he said this, quote, A church may look like a church on the surface, even being passionately committed to God's truth. But if it has no love for people, it cannot be rightly called a church. The Lord Jesus said love is such a vital part of the church to the Ephesians that he would eliminate such loveless churches from existence if they did not repent. And that's exactly what happened. And does he not warn these churches? 
And he warns the Ephesian church, if you don't repent and go back and do your first works of love, is that I will remove your candlestick. A very, very serious warning to the church. Church that's committed to truth, but doesn't emphasize um, the inseparable partner of love is well on its way of being cold, indifferent, and maybe in danger of the candlestick being removed. But let's move on. That's the reputation to pursue from this church. It was a reputation of faithfulness, a reputation of love. Now let's take a look at the reputation that impacts. And this is a natural conclusion, is if we are a people individually and as a church with a reputation of faithfulness and love, then it's going to impact people. Well, look at that verses 6 again through 9. And I want us to look at the impact. Now, this impact that they're having, we know that they impacted culture. That's from chapter 1. Everywhere they went, people were talking about their faith. Everywhere they went, they were spreading the word. This is an impact internally. It's an internal impact, certainly with each other. But Paul's emphasis in verses 6 through 9 is the impact that their reputation had on him, on the leadership. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? In chapters 1 and 2, Paul is defending himself. He's defending the ministry. He's defending who he is. But in chapter 3 and beyond, the emphasis becomes those of the Thessalonians. And what he is saying in this section, it's absolutely profound. He is saying, this is what how you are, this is your impact on me, on Silvanus, on Timothy. So don't underestimate your reputation as a Christian to the leaders in your church and to one another. Because you can be a great source of encouragement or you can be a great source of discouragement. And this is what we see in the Thessalonians. We see a positive impact on these leaders, on Paul. But also and it extends to all of us. Your reputation either encourages me or, encur- or discourages me. My reputation as a Christian either encourages or discourages you. And there's only two options. We'll conclude the message by remembering that you are, you are always progressing in the Christian life or you are digressing. There is never a, stand, a, stand po- a standing position that's called lukewarm. Let's take a look at four impacts here of the, uh, the reputation that Thessalonians had on the leaders and on one another. The first one is that their reputation of faith and love, it affirmed their respect, submission, love, and desire for fellowship with Paul or with the leaders and with one another. Look at verse 6 again. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly... Can you imagine that? He says, we always, you always remember us kindly. When Paul's name was mentioned, there wasn't a critical spirit. When other Christians were mentioned, there wasn't a critical spirit. They thought kindly. He says, you always think kindly of us. That's what Timothy is telling us. And then look at the rest of the verse. And they long, you long to see us. And then Paul says, as we long to see you. What we see here is a wonderful picture of hearts being knit together between the leadership and and, and the sheep. Leadership, congregation, sheep. They're knit together. And Paul is so affirmed by the submission, the love, and the desire for fellowship that these people had with him and with each other. Charles Simeon, a man greatly used in the 19th century in England, He's commented on this harmony between the leadership and the the sheep, that they spoke kindly of one another, that they loved one another, that they wanted to be with one another. He said this, there should be at all times a feeling of reciprocating affection. Do we have that? Are we pursuing that? And even more in each other's kitchen is our reputation, one that leaders in each other see as affirming, as one of submission, of one of encouragement. 
Paul, Paul was so thrilled to see that these Thessalonians hadn't forgotten him. He actually affirms them because they longed for him. They longed for that togetherness. So that's what a reputation of faith and love will do. It will affirm mutual respect, mutual submission, and a desire for fellowship. Let me ask you, did you drag yourself to church today or did you longingly come to church today? It's an important question because when the reputation of faith and love is deepening and and maturing uh, in us, there is this yearning and longing for togetherness, for this oneness that the Thessalonians long for and Paul for them. Secondly, look at verse 7. Here's a second impact of, of a reputation of faith and love on leaders and believers. It not only affirms mutual submission and, and respect, but also provides encouragement and comfort to weary leaders. No one is insignificant in the body of Christ. No one under the sound of my voice is insignificant to the health of our church. In fact, the health of our church is reliant upon our individual walks with the Lord. You contribute to the health of our church by your own personal walk. So that makes us either helpers or hinderers to our reputation. And what does he say in verse 7? For this reason, what reason? That they had walked by faith and love, that they were developing in these virtues. He said, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. Where was Paul's sense of comfort or encouragement? It was the testimony of their faith. And that's the second impact of an individual reputation and a corporate reputation of faith and love on other believers and leaders in particular. It provides encouragement and comfort. Let's remember here, look what it says in the verse. In all our distress and affliction... The word distress means crushing trouble, like to press down. Affliction means choking, intense stress. And Paul was experiencing that that at this very moment in Corinth. And what does he say is is, is my encouragement? What is is causing me to persevere? It's you, Thessalonians. It's It's your walk of faith. It's your walk of love. Do not underestimate the power of your faithfulness and a reputation of faithfulness and a reputation of love, what it does to your leaders. I don't like to be personal uh, much in the pulpit, but I can tell you from a pastor, your faithfulness is a great encouragement to me. Conversely, your inconsistency, if that applies, it's a great discouragement to leadership. Now, why would Paul say that you've comforted me, you've encouraged me in my distress and affliction about your faith? There's four things that we need to understand if we're going to be about the work of the gospel. Is number one, it's going to be opposed. It's going to be opposed by the devil. Twice Paul mentions the devil in regards to these Thessalonians. He hindered him from coming to them in chapter uh, chapter two. And then in chapter three, he says, I'm fearful he's a tempter to you. So all gospel work will be be opposed by the devil. Secondly, gospel labor is exhausting. It's exhausting. Paul would say that we labor night and day. Thirdly, the reason why he is afflicted and suffering and is encouraged by their faith because gospel labor is warfare. It's warfare against the principalities, against the, uh, the prince of the evil. And thirdly, because gospel labor is consuming physically, spiritually, and emotionally. I won't take the time to read it, but read uh, Paul's account to the elders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, and you'll see how he talks about in humility and tears and trials, I taught you day and night. Gospel labor will discourage. Hence, the reputation of faith and love, it not only shows respect and submission, desire for fellowship, but it provides comfort. It provides encouragement. And thus, when you are absent or you're inconsistent or that we're not involved in the mutual ministry of encouragement to one another, the default is discouragement. So the Thessalonians, then, we've seen that they have a reputation to pursue, a reputation of faithfulness, a reputation of love. We also see this result of that. It's a reputation that impacts. It affirms 
respect, submission, love, and desire for fellowship. It also provides encouragement and comfort to laboring and weary leaders. Now look at verse 8. Here's a third impact of a faith and, and love, a reputation uh, of a church and individuals have of one leaders in each other. It revives. It revives the leadership in their ministry. Paul would say in verse 8, For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Now, Paul is not obviously referring to literal life. He's using hyperbole. It's like saying, I cannot live without you. Or if you're like country music, uh, Leon Rhymes, how do I live without you? That's exactly what he's saying. He's using this intense language, this over-the-top language that's saying, if you are steadfast in the faith, if you are, are living a life of faith and love and hope, a reputation of faithfulness, a reputation of love, he said, if you're living that way, then I am revived. I am refreshed because of your faithfulness. John Lilly, Scottish man from another era, on this report of the Thessalonians and its comforting effect on Paul, he said this, the report was like a cold water to a thirsty soul and a fainting soul. You can see that in Paul. He goes from the depths of sleepless anxiety now that he hears they're doing well, and he not only feels affirmed because of their faithfulness and their reputation, he not only is comforted, but he's revived. He's revived in his ministry. There are times that you want to quit I'm thinking collectively. There's times you're tired of fighting sin. You're tired of failing. You're tired of falling short. You're tired of the, of the hard labor in the gospel and seeing no visible results. You get tired of that. You get weary and sometimes you may be tempted to say, coach, take me out. I need a break. Or you may even feel tempted. I'm just going to raise the white flag of surrender. And so how do you, how do you get out of that? You have a reputation like the Thessalonians of faith and love, and you focus on that, that, that mutual submission, that mutual care and love for one another, in this case, that you actually revive people. You can be an instrument of refreshment in a Christian. You do not know that there's someone in the sound of my voice today that is ready just to roll over and say, I'm done. And you come alongside that person and asking God for discernment, you may be the very voice of encouragement that lifts them up to fight another day. And that's a ministry all of us can do, is to revive each other by our mutual encouragement. Paul would even tell a young brother, Philemon, he would say, yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Paul commands him, it's an imperative. Refresh my heart in Christ. I think it begs the question, for us, in our reputation, and our involvement in, in togetherness, are we obedient to the command to refresh one another in Christ? Or are we drainers of our joy because we're oblivious to being refreshers to one another in Christ? You know, you're either going to be to one another and to leadership, you're either going to be a life preserver holding each other up in the storms of life or you're going to be an anchor driving people down in the storms of life. And so ask yourself a question. Is my reputation like the Thessalonians? Am I one that affirms and supports and loves? Am I one that longs for the fellowship of the saints and the leaders so that I can be a source of encouragement? Am I an instrument of personal refreshment to other Christians? Am I a life preserver or am I an anchor? Well, here's the fourth one. Here's the fourth one. Look at verse 9. The fourth impact of a reputation of faith and love, it prompts prayerful thanksgiving to God for work in growing believers. Paul says, For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. It's like Paul is so overwhelmed with joy because he sees and hears of the growth in these young believers that he doesn't have words to say. He says, what thanksgiving can we return to God for all the joy that we feel? Do you rejoice in the growth of other Christians? Do I, do I rejoice to see people come to Christ and then mature in Christ? 
I think too often this, the spirits, the ugly sinful spirits of envy and jealousy infiltrate the church. And yet Paul would say, listen, I am just so thrilled that you're growing. I am so thrilled, overflowed with joy, that all I can do is give thanksgiving to God for you. You notice, notice what's missing here? They are where they are because of Paul. But Paul's not drawing attention to himself. Yes, he was the instrument, but it's not about the instrument. It's about him who uses the instrument. And so Paul applies uh, that to himself, saying, I'm just so overthrilled because of what God has done and what God is doing. Learn to be thankful for what God is doing in other people's lives and also be a part of that growth in them. And then finally, we'll close with this. We've seen in these Thessalonians a model reputation to pursue. It's a reputation near and far of faithfulness. Day in, day out, uh, stick to itness in the things of God, always eyeing the second coming of Christ. They had a reputation to pursue of love. God was teaching them how to love, and you can imagine the, the progression that was happening among them. They also, as a result, have, had a reputation that impacts Because of their walk of faith and love, they were affirming people to their leadership uh, in respect and submission and to one another. They also provided encouragement and comfort to those who are laboring hard and growing weary. They revived and refreshed people. They saw themselves as life preservers, not anchors. And thus all of that prompted them to have a reputation that impacted Paul to where he would pray earnestly for their growth. And that leads us to the last thing. Verse 10. They had a reputation that needed to mature. It needed to mature. Paul says, If we pray most earnestly day and night that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. He's given a glowing affirmation of where they are, but he's saying you're not done. You're not done. There's still more to go. This awareness of their pockets of immaturity, this awareness drove him to labor for for prayer. He said, I pray most earnestly night and day that I would come to mature you. Now, what is lacking? Verse 10, what is lacking in your faith? Uh, That's in chapters 4 and 5. He will define what is lacking and where they need to mature. But the point for today, and take away from this and the application is that you never arrive in your spiritual life. You never arrive. Twice Paul would say to these Thessalonians, what you're doing, do it more and more. In verse 1 of chapter 4, we already read, he says that you are pleasing God. Well, don't rest in what you've done. You press on more and more in your obedience to God. Then in verse uh, 9 and 10, we read that as well. He says, I know that you're loving people. God is teaching you to love, but do this more and more. It is a very, very dangerous spiritual sign when you are contented where you are spiritually. And it's equally alarming if you're discontented and you're not trying to pursue contentment in Christ. The greatest Christian who ever lived, the Apostle Paul, he knew no resting, He knew no coasting. There was no arrival point. And this is what he would say in Philippians 3.12. Not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. How much more so us? Always pursuing, never achieving. That shouldn't discourage you. Because the more you pursue, the more you know him. The more you enjoy him. And this is certainly a truth, a truism. The more that you taste the goodness of Christ, and the more that you taste the sweet fellowship of the triune God, it creates a further appetite in you. Always satisfied, but never satisfied. The more that you know him, the more you want him. And it intensifies to where it's a good type of anxiety. Where Paul would say, I am so anxious, I'd rather be with the Lord. But nevertheless, I'm here for your joy. 
May the Thessalonians be a wonderful model for us by way of reputation. I won't do the review again, but think through these things and ask yourself the question. Are you pursuing the reputation that they had? And are you contributing to that reputation in our church that we want to have?